cumulative risk of analytic an analysis of carcinogenic contaminants in the United States is a very important article, a, med a medical journal article that came out. Um, and this was in, uh, it looked at 2010 to 2017, um, a period of that time. It looked over 100,000, uh, it indicates that over 100,000 lifetime cancer cases could be due to carcinogenic chemicals in tap water. That was their um, assessment. Um, majority of this risk is due to the presence of arsenic, disinfection byproducts, and radioactive contaminants. So um, again, this was something that just came out not too long ago, and um, it was pretty striking. Um, another interesting story, Americans chilling problem with tap water safety. So you'll see a lot of this, this is 2020. Um, this was in the Washington Times, November 16th, 2020, an op-ed. And I believe that was around the time that that previous article came out about cancer risk. So what can we do about it? I want to spend, yeah, we have a decent amount of time to talk about it. So let's talk about what we do with our water and how do we clean it up and, and get it together? Because if we're waiting for legislation, it's like waiting for Goodell. We're never going to we're never going to get to where we need to be, given all the contaminants that we are exposed to. So I want to make sure I leave people with something tangible. EWG um, has a tap water database. You can go to Environmental Working Group. They're very good for a lot of things, including looking up personal care products, looking up cleaning products. Very reputable group. We use them a lot in our book, Non-Toxic. Um, so, you know, this should say 2020, but essentially they have a tap water database where you can type in your um, zip code. Um, is it perfect? No, um, but it's, it's a good way to get started. It's a good way to engage patients or family members to really start to think about this issue and maybe help motivate them to the next steps. It's, which is filtering. We want to filter our water. We want to filter our water at what's called the point of use, which means that no matter what a municipal tap system, wastewater treatment plant sends your way through PVC piping and lead piping and breaks in the piping where there's, you know, fertilizers and chemicals from farming or what have you, when it gets to your home is when you have the greatest control over what is in your drinking water and therefore what goes into you. And so um, what's really important is that, you know, you can have a well, you can have municipal tap, doesn't matter if it comes up from the ground, if it goes, you know, through from, you know, um, 20 miles away, you're controlling the contaminants at the point of use. Um, so there are many types of filtration processes that you can use. We're not going to have time to go through all of them in detail, but I want to give a smattering so you can understand. And then, of course, um, I will hold up the book because I'm proud of it. It's Non-Toxic Guide to Living Healthy in a Chemical World, which does go into greater detail, um, a whole chapter on drinking water because it's that important. Um, and to start with, you know, these look like they are basically carbon block filters, um, which means a big chunk of carbon in there it could be granulated carbon, like in the, in the picture above, um, which is kind of like, um, you know, granulated. It's not like a solid piece. It's kind of looks like sand almost, but black sand. Um, essentially, these are reasonable ways to take out a decent amount of lead, chlorine, um, and um, some other contaminants, um, some detergents, but they are all dependent on certification, specifically NSF, uh, certification is the best way to judge. Um, and um, let me see, NSF, um, hold on, I want to just give you some more information. But anyway, um, essentially, there's certification processes that we'll talk about, um, you know, whether you have carbon block or granular, um, how much water spends sitting in granular versus around carbon block is depend, you know, basically um, helps determine how many contaminants are actually removed and how much. Um, so the longer the time spent around these uh, filters, the more they're going to be pulling uh, contaminants. If the water is running fast, you're going to have obviously less ability to pull and extract contaminants from rushing water versus slow process uh, where water is slowly cleaned. Um, pitchers usually you fill up and they kind of just um, run the water through those um, carbon granular, carbon or carbon block. And so then you're, you're getting clean water underneath. Whereas a faucet, certainly it goes a little slower because there's nowhere to store the water. Um, so that's one type. Um, 
there's lots of types you can put in your refrigerator has carbon block typically um and um and as i mentioned pitchers there's distillers ion exchange uv filters water softeners there's all different types of filtration systems for people's different needs but i have now come to understand that um although many do have their limitations for instance uv filters basically kill bacteria but they do not um affect um shelled microorganisms like cryptosporidium um and giardia so uv filters are not helpful in that area because they can affect the shell of that microorganism as opposed to bacteria and viruses um distilled water um depending on which company again i'm not a, a specialist in every brand but i will tell you distillers generally take off minerals as well as many chemicals um so often the water does not have minerals which i'm okay with and we'll talk about that because I expect that you'll get your minerals back with fruits and vegetables that are pesticide free. Um, but distillers also have trouble, um, depending on the brand, with VOCs, which are volatile organic compounds. So the distillers steam the water and then the contaminants fly up and the good water kind of condensates. Um, and that's great. But then what if the VOCs and the chemicals are, are with the steamed water? Um, that actually makes its way into the water. So again, there's ways to fix that by adding carbon components to it. So that's something you have to work out with your distiller company. Um, but the idea is that um, there are a lot of options and it'll do something. Now, my favorite is reverse osmosis. It has its benefits and, and limitations, its pros and cons as well. Um, but it is the most aggressive uh, way to clean water that we as consumers have available to us. And the reason being is because, you know, I looked at books, actually, it was interesting, about 14 years ago, there's a wonderful book on drinking water that I was reading. And at that time, they were writing about how there's this new thing called reverse osmosis, and you can add on different attachments, but it's very expensive. It's very interesting. Now they're not expensive. The good ones, the certified ones, the NFS, NSF certified are not expensive. They're $250, sometimes $300 for good ones. Um, made in America, every single part is what I recommend because you can outsource parts. Um, some of the big box stores will say made in America. And then of course, they'll outsource the most important parts like the filter portion. Um, so I'm really, really a big fan of reverse osmosis. Reverse osmosis is used for water in dialysis. My dad and my brother are both nephrologists. And so we debated out why are we making sure nationally under federal law that RO filters are used to clean water that goes into dialysis patients, but they're not adjusting or fixing that for everyday citizens that don't have renal problems or, or are on dialysis. So these are the kinds of things that kind of boggle my mind, but you know, RO filters, typically good ones that are certified will have different components. As you can see, here's a sediment component a carbon block component, the membrane, which is typically the RO component, uh, which is super thin, the micron of, portion si of pore size is so small that it actually catches viruses and uh, which are the smallest particulate matter, um, radon, some of the nucleotides. Um, and so there's all different additions you can make to it, but in general, an RO filter takes time to wash the water, essentially go through all that surface area, and then it drip, 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 drip slowly into a tank. There's no way you can use an RO filter specifically at your shower head, but you can get a whole house filter. Um, that's reverse osmosis, quite expensive, um, but depends on your priorities, of course. Um, the um, tank water basically is what you're drawing off of when you drink um, drinking water or use it to cook with cooking water. So um, again, cost effective. Now it does in fact, use a lot of water. It wastes water. So if you are in a state like California where water is monitored very closely and charged for, then you're going to think about how much you use to drink and cook because that's all you're paying for is essentially the amount of what you drink and cook um, because it shouldn't waste water while the tank is full. Um, but in order to create on average about one gallon of water, of drinkable purified reverse osmosis water, you're going to waste about anywhere from three to five gallons of water that goes out and that you pay for. So that's what I want people to think about in terms of cost effectiveness for their own situation. This is one of the filters in my RO filter. 
literally every time we change it out, I live in farmland. I don't know where that water's been before it reaches our house, but certainly there's enough sediment and enough goop. I tried to get this tested, but they required that I give them the name of the chemical to look for. And it was $50 each chemical. And I thought, you know what? There's just too many chemicals to spend money on. I'd rather put it in other places. So um, I would just say that this doesn't look healthy. And this is what I get in my water about every 12 months when we change out the filters, 10 to 12 months. EWG has a wonderful um, online and uh, online site for tap water and guide to water filters. Um, I also say transport your water. What, what's the irony of carrying clean, super wonderful water in junky containers like BPA uh, plastic bottles or BPA free, which is nonsense. They just replace BPA with BPS, BPS IP. Um, so don't ever tr think that plastic is safe if they even label it because um, there are many other chemicals that are being used in substitutions. We now call them regrettable substitutions. And so I recommend stainless steel and glass, which are inert. They don't have any, um, especially glass, no an, an activity. And so when you have distilled water, um, it's considered water that's aggressive that will pull often a lot of times chemicals from plastics if it's stored in plastic because it's um, been removed of its minerals. So it's active, it's aggressive, it needs to pull from somewhere. So again, with distilled water, um, you wanna be careful to make sure you store it in glass, um, but pretty much all in glass would be great. Plastic water bottles, um, this is a huge topic and I certainly wanna save time for questions, but this is a huge topic. So the US Food and Drug Administration um, basically manages, here, let me, Go on this. The the food the bottled water industry is managed by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. However, the Safe Drinking Water Act, which just covers 91 chemicals, which is not great, doesn't even apply to bottled water. They're exempt from bottled water for for the Safe Drinking Water Act. So those 91 chemicals are not even tested or required to be tested because if they're sent, brought in from other states or what we call intrastate bottles then you're, they're not required. I don't know why, it just blows my mind. So of course, all water is interstate, you know? Um, and so they're not required. So at the state level, um, there can be some requirements at the state, um, but that's even often not overseen very well. And then there's the International Bottled Water Association or IBWA, which is a private trade group, which, is, which does have stricter standards than the FDA. Um, they often use the NSF, which I mentioned is the international um, certification um, for water filters, um, and they'll often use it. That NSF stands for National Sanitation Foundation International. So um, you want to look for that on anything you buy for filtration. Um, but essentially, most bottled water, plastic bottled water is um, tap water, municipal tap water, which we already know is pretty dirty. Um, also bottled water travels often it sits in warehouses in hundred degree weather. I have a great picture of that in my book that just, I'm at a light in Cape May, New Jersey in hundred degree weather, watching these pallets of water, just sitting there for like a half an hour. I just sat there and it was hundred degree and they were just sitting there waiting to be loaded up on a non-refrigerated truck. So before it gets to your refrigerator, it's been sitting in hot temperatures, potentially traveling. And, um, and that just bodes not well for the contaminants from the plasticizers in those bottles. Um, so it's really important to think about. Now, many of these have the plastic chemical PET or polyethylene tetraphthalate, um, which is also recycling code number one in the triangle. Um, and the big issues with, some, with one and two in the triangle is, is really um, antimony, which is uh, on the elements chart. Um, which can have carcinogenic properties, um, but mostly it's the phthalates, DEHP that are often in the, in the bottles that are endocrine disruptors. And some really interesting studies that we put in, in the book, which I'll hold up again, um, is when they were growing snails in plastic water bottles. And you could see changes in growth and development in the pregnant snails um, because there was low level estrogenic activity. There's plenty of great studies that have now shown that plastic bottles do produce low level um, phthalate uh, contaminants that increase risk for estrogenic components to their experiments um, in terms of exposure. And so we did list some really good studies that were well done to kind of illustrate that um, in case you have relatives uh, 
or kids like myself who insist that they want plastic water bottles all the time. So, you know, you have to work with people, but we wanted simple studies that were really well done and easy to share with uh, people as well. Ah, he was on my way back from Cape May. This is not even the one at the, at the red light. So this was hundred degree weather, um, just waiting for people to get their bottled water in hundred degree heat. Ah, this is the actual picture. I didn't realize I had it. So I was sitting at a red light, just staring for half an hour. I thought it was a good experiment. And of course, even at a half an hour, no one came out to lift it into the truck. Boxed water is better. Well, maybe for the environment, but you know, we do know that there's a plastic lining to all Tetra packs and to all cartons. Does it mean we should all just throw up our hands and stop buying all this stuff? Probably not. Um, I mean, I'm doing my best to try to find things in glass, but it's not easy. Um, you know, I would say if you're going to get water, you're saving money by getting a water filtration system in your house and just filling up at home. We, we take three bottles to every sports game, um, you know, so it's just cheaper. You'll know where your water comes from 80, 90% of the time, depending on how much you eat out. Um, but again, we're thinking here environmental as opposed to greening our body, which is very critical is thinking about how our body stays healthy as well from exposures, not just our environment. Um, again, the tap water database, um, you can get reports and testing from this zip code um, from EWG, but you can also require, your, you are allowed and municipal taps, uh, wastewater treatment plants, sorry, are required to give an annual report um, to their residents that they serve in terms of what are the um, contaminants that hit the MCL maximum contaminant limit um, and what they did about it. So I think that's really important to think about, about getting your annual report. Um, may inspire you to get a different type of filtration system, depending if you live in an area with high amounts of radon versus um, areas that have a lot of um, farm runoff where I live um, versus uh, industrial you know, buildings. Um, I think it's all really important to think about. You can also look up Superfund sites in terms of where you live in the country and how many Superfund sites are close to you or military bases, because all of them have risk to what the contaminants are around those areas. Um, here's a sample annual water quality report um, that you can get off the internet, but essentially it'll tell you what it hit in terms of the MCL, what's the cutoff, what they hit, and, um, and even if they um, remediated the problem, how they did that. So I'm back to basically just take home messages and we'll go to questions. Um, it looks like I have a, a clock that says when I'm getting yanked off. So that's good to know. Municipal and well water in the US is a source for contamination and a potential and potential health effects. No question about it. I think it's a major problem that people aren't thinking about um, and it should be prioritized. I don't think any patient of mine leaves the office without enough information to get going with water filtration. So that's a priority in my, in my world. Um, filter at the point of use, as I mentioned, at your tap, whether it's a pitcher, whether it's reverse osmosis, whatever you're doing is worth it. Even kids in college, I have a lot of college students that are my patients. I teach them how to manage living in different apartments, um, moving from dorm room, how you can create this world of cleaner water as best you can within the confines of your situation. Um, carry water and stainless steel and glass, aboard, aboard Sports bottles that say BPA free. Um, again, BPA free means nothing in the United States. It means that they've often, not always, but often put in substitutes like BPS, BPSB, um, BPSIP. And these have been shown to actually not only been just as bad as BPA in terms of its endocrine disruption capability um, and immune system disruption, but also um, it's they've been shown to be worse um, in many tests. Uh, in many journal articles. So we really wanna think about labeling. I say stay away from plastics as much as possible with cooking, from drinking, food storage, um, manage drinking water, especially in pregnancy and the elderly and the immunocompromised. It's really kind of critical when you're creating fetus. Um, it's not to blame, certainly is not my intention. I didn't know better when I was pregnant. It's really about educating in a very reasonable way. Um, there's no one to blame here, um, perhaps the government. <laughs> Um, but there's no one individually. If I, as a doctor who has taken every science class from here to JPIP, didn't know a thing about environmental health only 10 years ago, I cannot imagine 
um, you know, how we would expect individual consumers to know without doing it on their own in some way, because doctors aren't teaching this. So um, they're not teaching it in med school, so they're not teaching it to patients. So um, I just urge people to really educate people in a way that just doesn't feel like you shut them down, but really empowers them. And the book was written in such a way that it's not meant to shout, it's meant to educate and empower. That was important. Um, use bottled water when you know there's an emergency contamination. Of course, if you're you have a flood situation or a major you know tornadoes or what have you, you know bottled water is necessary when you travel. If you don't have your own bottle, of course. But when you can control drinking water about 80% of your time, I think that's a huge win. Knowing what we know how, about water. Um, so more quick tips. If you're drinking tap water, which a lot of people still do, even my family members, I'm like shocked to hear this. Um, but you let it run a full 10 seconds in the mornings before you drink it. And then maybe at a slower half the flow, because the, you, you have lead that's stuck in pipes overnight, stagnant water. Um, you can get lead and other contaminants. And when you turn it on fast speed, you're also releasing that from the sides of the interior of those pipes. So again, 10 seconds, then slow down the, the drizzle to fill your water container. If you're going to drink tap water, if you're just stuck and you have no other way to manage water, of course. Um, for hot water, actually use cold water and then heat it up because the, the heat actually increases contaminants. Um, so you really don't want to run hot water to drink it or cook with it if you can avoid it. Store all removable pitcher parts and systems in the fridge. Of course, there's microorganism growth. Um, just from drinking from plastic bottles, we contaminate the bottle with our own mouth microorganisms. But, you know, in, individually, it's not a big deal, but you don't want to just keep drinking from water um, beyond a 24 hour period, 30, 20, 36 hour period, because you can get actually some illnesses from that. Store open bottled water in a fridge, as I mentioned, not in the sun, even closed bottled water, you wanna stay away from the sun because you don't want heat if there is contamination. Check your free annual water report. As I mentioned, avoid water from carboys, plastic water delivery companies. People swear by them and I understand. Listen, I, I was there too. I was schlepping water bottles for, I don't know, seven years um, prior to getting um, a water system, a reverse osmosis water system. And boy, does it pay itself back in no time to get an RO system that's certified and well vetted. Um, but then also it's the schlep factor. You don't have to pick up bottles and, you know, all the other risks that go along with plastic and, and the earth and contamination. So um, I, I try to get people to think about that. Wells test for bacteria, nitrates, and a bunch of other contaminants at least once a year, even if you're not selling your property, which is required. Um, so you should do that willingly if you're going to be showering with that water, perhaps, even if you're not um, cooking with it. Um, so just think about that. So these are some of my resources. Um, I think they're all reputable. Um, but uh, so, so I, you can certainly screenshot that, but they're basically available online. One of my favorite Pictures and my favorite quotes, let us not look back in anger or forward in fear, but aware, but around in awareness. And that's really my whole MO is to get us to think about being proactive to doing for ourselves and our families um, and not waiting for someone to do this or our government to come into place. There are people that are working very hard on Capitol Hill and trying to make these things happen in terms of legislative change. That's not my area. And I want to keep my energy in my lane. And um, if you have a lane that you feel like you can make some real strides in, go for it. Um, educate others, certainly. More resources, um, many of which were already covered there. Um, if you're interested in a TED Talk, if you want to share it with your kids, your students, your patients, this is 13 minutes. Um, this is basically the data that I collected from two pilot projects at Princeton High School. Um, trying to figure out if the kids were even interested in environmental health, what environmental health was, and then a series of lectures talking about drinking water one day or personal care products and looking up chemicals in their products. So I got the data that these kids not only wanted, they really wanted it and were the prime demographic to do so. So that's going to be my life's work. But the this TED Talk, I hope, is entertaining because it really kind of goes through the story of my dog all the way to where I am now. Um, and it's not very long. So this is the final or one of the final slides. These are the two textbooks or te two books. The first is a textbook um, that was written through Oxford University Press with my partner, Dr. Fred Vom Saul, who many of you may or may not know, um, was largely responsible for having BPA, for getting BPA 
um, removed from baby bottles in 2012. That was the only place they could get it out of, mind you, even though it was found to be an endocrine disruptor. The first one that was incredibly well studied, that was his work and his colleagues. Um, so he has been my partner. Um, he's phenomenal. And um, we did that for Andrew Weil's um, integrative academic series, um, which is a wonderful series. And then we jumped off from that into a consumer book with Oxford University Press. And this is, I think, the culmination of, I would say, nine years of figuring it out, figuring out what I wish I had at the time to figure this out, and then kind of giving it back to people to help them make decisions as they choose um, in their journey to remove chemicals. So it gives the historical background, the regulatory issues, the, you know, the wins, the failures, but then it goes into real practical options what to do for all of the different scenarios we bring up. So I hope people will check that out and maybe give it to a teenager or um, a, you know, someone who's trying to get pregnant or, or anybody. It's good for everybody at every age group. And then for those of you who may wanna, you know, who are on social media, this is really my baby in terms of my education work. I try to post Monday, Wednesday. I do post Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Facebook, Instagram, probably three times a week. Um, the podcast has really interesting people that I was managed to pull from um, environmental health research and lawyers in environmental health and just really topics that I was psyched to learn about and also colleagues that wrote chapters in previous years. So I hope people will check out the podcast. It's an environmental health podcast, but it's, it's filled with a lot of flavor, I hope. Um, but please follow and share with family, friends. It's meant to um, be entertaining on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. The website is thesmarthuman.com, uh, and that's really the end of my talk. So I hope you'll support. This helps me get grants to teach high school and college. So the more supporters, the better. So thank you very much. I don't sell anything either. I don't sell or monetize it at all.